too. I eat it because I like it. One of the most spectacular current growth industries is that concerned with the production and distribution of health foods. In Britain and the United States, almost every neighborhood has its special store where you can, it seems, ensure eternal youth by buying hand-woven honey, free-range carrots, and stone-ground eggs. There is no doubt that people today are very worried about their food. But different people are worried about different things, and most of them are worried about the wrong things. I can assure you that it really does not matter to your health whether your chicken is produced by the broiler system or whether you eat potatoes grown with chemical fertilizers. But it does matter that your diet is now very likely to be different from that which has been evolved over millions of years as the diet most suitable for you as a member of the species Homo sapiens. Please don't take these sentences to imply that I have discovered the secrets of the ideal diet. Because I have written rather teasingly about natural foods, I do not mean to imply that everything you see in the health food store is nonsense, and that everything I shall be telling you is an absolute certainty. It is true, though, that every person tends to believe that a knowledge of nutrition is somehow instinctive and that careful thought and introspection will provide as good an answer to nutritional questions as do the studies and research of the professional nutritionists. It is silly to insist, in spite of all the detailed evidence to the contrary, that there are any differences in the nutritional value of potatoes produced on land fertilized by chemical fertilizers or by compost. On the other hand, it is equally silly of some scientists to imagine that we know all there is to know about human nutrition. There is, for example, no justification for the statement I heard at a scientific meeting where a food chemist said that scientists don't have to concern themselves too much about producing enough high-protein foods. Human beings will soon be able to feed themselves entirely with synthetic protein and other nutrients and this at a time when new facts are discovered almost daily about such supposedly well-understood phenomena as obesity or the effects of dietary carbohydrates. The safest position is somewhere between arrogance based on unrecognized ignorance and arrogance based on unwarranted certainty. But how do we find this position? What sorts of principles do we adopt in order to decide whether this or that food is good for you. What indeed should the ideal diet be? I am going to devote the rest of this chapter to trying to answer these questions, slowly and carefully, because I believe that an understanding of the biology of the diet provides the clues to what the Western diet should be, what is wrong with it today, and why it has gone wrong. We begin by reminding ourselves that all animals require two sorts of materials for their growth and survival. One is material that can be burned, oxidized, to yield the energy needed for the processes of living, growth and movement and breathing, and all the other activities that distinguish a living animal from a dead one. These materials for energy production are mainly carbohydrates and fats, although protein can also be used in this way. The second sort of material consists of those thousands of different compounds that go to make up the very complex chemical composition of the cells of different tissues that, organized together, constitute the whole living animal. The vast majority of these compounds can be made by the body itself from a very much smaller number of raw materials but these are all materials that must, each one of them, be supplied to the body. Without them, a young organism cannot grow, and an adult organism will gradually waste away, because it is unable to make good the general wear and tear of its cells and tissues. So we can say at this point that the body has to be given materials both to supply energy and to provide the raw materials for growth and repair. The source of these essential materials is our food and drink. These have to supply about 50 different items. They fall into several classes. 
the carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins, the vitamins, the mineral elements, and of course water. As far as we know, every single species of animal needs the same components for life and sustenance, and almost every single species has to get all of these out of food. The exceptions are interesting and include ruminants like cows, which can get many vitamins from microbes living in their complicated stomachs. But in general, as I said, most animals have to get all of their vitamins, protein and so on from their food, and these nutrients are needed in roughly the same proportions by all animal species. You could therefore argue that all species of animals should eat the same foods, but in fact, it is well known that different species eat very different diets indeed. Some, like the lion and the tiger, are largely carnivorous, meat-eating. Others, like rabbits and giraffes and deer, are largely herbivorous, plant-eating or vegetarian. Others again, like ourselves and rats and pigs, eat diets that come from both animal and plant sources. These animals are omnivorous. By contrast, some animals eat only a very limited range of foods. The giraffe eats little except leaves from acacia trees. The koala bear eats little except eucalyptus leaves, and then only from a few of the 400 or so existing species. So there is an apparent contradiction. First, all species of animals require the same in the way of nutrients, which, with a few exceptions, they must get from their food. But secondly, different species of animals get these same nutrients from very different sorts of diet. Great biological advantages flow from this because it prevents the various species competing with each other for the same foods. Each species establishes its own ecological niche in regard to its food supply. Its anatomy and physiology are well adapted to find, acquire, eat, chew, and digest the foods that it chooses. But the fact remains that one species will often not even attempt to eat foods that are highly sought after by another species. So what makes one animal choose one sort of diet, and a different animal choose a completely different sort? Clearly it cannot be that they are choosing different foods for the nutrients they contain, since their nutrient needs are so similar. It must therefore be some other properties of foods that make one range of foods look especially attractive to one species, and another range especially attractive to another. These qualities are shape and size, colour and smell, taste and texture, features that I'd lump together, perhaps too loosely, under the heading of palatability. Food thus possesses two different properties, palatability and nutritional value. The palatability of foods, and so the foods chosen to make up the total diet, varies from species to species. However, the nutritional needs that have to be satisfied by these various species are virtually the same for all species. Thus, animals choose diets that they find palatable. But whatever these diets are, they must supply all their nutritional needs. If they did not, the animals would perish. So we can say that when an animal eats what it wants, it gets what it needs, or, in terms I have just been using, for each sort of animal palatability is a guide to nutritional value. Everyone instinctively feels that this is correct. If you like some food very much, it is taken to indicate, to prove almost, that you need this food. Eating habits are formed in childhood, and children like sweet foods. Does it follow that sugar must be good for them? Not at all, although I am sure that most people have heard this sort of argument. One also hears phrases like the one in the old music hall song, A little of what you fancy does you good. And so long as human beings did not manufacture foods, this argument was perfectly sound. The Origin of the Human Diet 
I shall come back later to the question of when it is true that what you want is what you need and when it is not true. Let me now pick up the story of palatability and nutritional value and see how it applies to our own species. Science is gradually learning quite a lot about our origins, and although there are still a lot of uncertainties about the early human diet, one can now make some pretty good guesses. It is generally agreed that our earliest ancestors, the squirrel-like primates of some 70 million years ago, were vegetarian. They continued as vegetarians up to about 20 million years ago, for they had no difficulty in surviving on fruits, nuts, berries and leaves. But then the rainfall began to decrease and the earth entered a 12 million year period of drought. The forests shrank and their place was taken by ever-increasing areas of open savanna. It was during this time that Australopithecus africanus emerged. Australopithecus means southern ape. In order to survive, africanus had to forsake the vegetarian and fruitarian existence of the related hominid Australopithecus robustus and change to a scavenging and hunting existence that was largely carnivorous. The molar teeth of africanus had the shape and thin enamel of a carnivore. The jaw muscles were small and did not need the crested cranium of Robustus for their attachment. The canines were also small, for Africanus killed neither with fangs nor with claws or horns, but with weapons, having adopted a completely erect posture which freed the arms and hands from the need to be used for locomotion. Africanus's earliest weapons were bones. Only later did stones begin to be used, and still later the axe. Thus it appears that for at least two million years our ancestors were largely meat-eating. From that time they continued to be scavengers and hunters, seeking their favourite food of meat and offal. They had one advantage over the more strictly carnivorous species— in that they could and did eat vegetable foods too. Along with meat, their diets contained the nuts, berries, leaves and roots that had fed their forebears. This omnivorous potential gave them the ability to survive when their prey eluded them or was scarce. In nutritional terms, the diet of prehistoric human beings and their ancestors during perhaps two million years or more was rich in protein moderately rich in fat, and usually poor in carbohydrate. If we assume that our present universal taste preferences for the sweet and savoury are a continuation of preferences acquired long ago, then it is likely that, except in times of hunger, the small amounts of dietary carbohydrates will have come mostly from fruits, as opposed to the less palatable leaves and roots. The Two Food Revolutions Until very recently, in evolutionary terms, all animals, including human beings, depended for their food supplies on hunting or scavenging other animals, or on the consumption of wild vegetation. It was less than 10,000 years ago, compared with the two million years or more of carnivorous ancestry, that we became uniquely food producers. Agricultural food production seems to have originated independently at three different times in three different parts of the world, from which it then spread. The first was around 10,000 years ago, in the Fertile Crescent, in what is now Israel, Jordan, Syria, Turkey and Iran, with the cultivation of wheat, barley, lentils and peas, and the domestication of cattle, sheep and goats. About 7,000 years ago, agriculture began in China, producing rice, soybeans, yams and pigs. The area that came last to agriculture was Central America, where the chief crops were maize and beans, and where llamas and guinea pigs were raised. In most instances, then, food production began with the cultivation of cereals. 
This derived from the discovery that some of the wild grasses, whose seeds were occasionally eaten, could yield many times that amount of edible seeds if they were deliberately planted. The domestication of these grasses produced the cereals that are now the staple food of a large part of present-day humanity, and it was followed, or accompanied, by the domestication of root crops and of wild animals that were used both for food and as animals of burden. The result of the discovery of agriculture, the Neolithic Revolution, were many and far-reaching. Human beings ceased being nomads and began to live in settled, socially organized communities. This landmark of progress became the basis for all that we know of civilization, with its arts, its inventions, and its discoveries. Compared with hunting and foraging, agriculture usually yielded more food. It also allowed the cultivation of areas where existing resources of food would have been inadequate. Thus, the human population grew, because fewer died of food shortage and because people spread into increasing areas of the Earth's surface. But in due course, the limits of food production again became the limits to the numbers that could be fed. The inevitable pressure of population on food supplies tended to produce and stabilize a type of diet quite different from that of our hunting ancestors. It was, and still is, much easier to produce vegetable foods than animal foods. For a given area of land, some ten times as many calories can be produced in the form of cereals or root crops than in the form of meat, eggs or milk. The effect of the Neolithic Revolution was thus to alter the components of the diet so that it was now rich in carbohydrate and poor both in protein and in fat. The carbohydrate was overwhelmingly starch, with sugars supplied only to a small extent as before by wild fruits and vegetables. It is likely that deficiency of protein and of many of the vitamins began to affect large sections of the human species only after they became food producers. Human beings, like all animals, constantly face recurring periods of food shortage. Although the Neolithic Revolution increased total food supplies and radically changed the composition of our diet, hunger and famine did not vanish. For most of the time, wind, drought, flood, and our own exploitation of the land have combined to limit food production to levels lower than those necessary to feed all our offspring. It is only in the last few decades that a sizable proportion of people, though still only a minority, have been born into a situation where it is likely that they will never know real hunger throughout their lives. The reasons for this second revolutionary change are the cumulative effects of science and technology. I need only list a few of these to show the extent of this revolution and its effect upon the availability of food to mankind. Genetics and the breeding of improved varieties of plants and animals for food. Engineering and its effect on drainage and irrigation. The discovery of synthetic fertilizers weed killers and pesticides, the internal combustion engine and its effect upon transport by sea, land and air, modern methods of food preservation by canning, dehydration, deep freezing. I could cite many more examples of changes that have given humanity the possibility of producing and preserving much more food than has ever been available to any other species. As a result, in the affluent countries, a large proportion of the populations has a very wide choice of foods, irrespective of season or geography. The effect has been that these people are able, more and more, to choose foods that please their palates, and not simply foods that fill their stomachs. The first and most obvious result has been an increase in the consumption of more palatable foods, such as meat and fruit. And because of the basic association between palatability and nutrition, there has come a simultaneous improvement in the nutritional standards in these groups, 
just as there has always been a better level of nutrition in the much smaller section that comprises the wealthy members of any population. The advances in agricultural techniques and general technology have had an effect not only on the yield of food and the availability of food. They have also had a tremendous effect on the way foods can deliberately be changed by extractions and additions, so that quite new foods can be made that do not exist in anything like these forms in nature. Some of these manufactured foods have been in existence for quite a long time. Bread, for example, and tortillas and chapatis and cakes and biscuits. But most of them have been produced or vastly improved only in the past century or two or in recent decades. I am now thinking of ice cream and soft drinks, an enormous range of chocolate and confectionery, and new sorts of snacks in the form of sweet and savoury biscuits. And there is now a new range of meat products made from textured vegetable or microbial protein. We can do all these things largely because nutritional value and palatability are two different qualities. As I pointed out, Although we can use as food almost any sort of animal or vegetable material, our preferences are for the particular palatability qualities of meat and of fruit, which together can supply all the nutrients we require. We are only just beginning to emulate the taste and texture of meat, and people will be eating and relishing significant quantities of the new vegetable or microbial protein foods only when the food manufacturer imparts to them qualities that make them much more attractive than he has been able to do up to now. But for some time, industry has been able to isolate an essence of sweetness, which has the property of imparting a very desirable palatability to a wide range of foods and drinks. People do not demand a particular flavour and texture to go with sweetness although they seem to demand only a very limited range of flavours and textures to go with savoury foods. The human avidity for sweetness could, for vast periods of time, be satisfied almost exclusively by the eating of fruit. Rarely, and in very small quantities, our ancestors might be lucky enough to find some honey produced by wild bees. But sometime after the Neolithic Revolution, Perhaps 2,500 years ago, people found that they could produce a crude sort of sugar by extracting and drying the sap of the sugar cane. This first began to be cultivated probably in India, and its cultivation slowly spread to China, Arabia, the Mediterranean, and later to South and West Africa, the Canary Islands, Brazil, and the Caribbean. In spite of this increasing area of cultivation, the cost of the sugar, crude as it was, was extremely high, so that by the middle of the 16th century it was said to be equivalent to the present cost of caviar. Compared with the price of foods such as butter or eggs, it has been calculated that the price of sugar has fallen to about two hundredth of its price in the 15th century. Even as late as the 18th century, sugar was a luxury, and until a hundred years or so ago, domestic sugar boxes were often provided with lock and key. It was chiefly the development of the sugar plantations in the Caribbean, based on the slave trade, that set the pattern of the sugar industry in the form known today. The demand for sugar was so great, and its production so lucrative, the tremendous improvements began to be made from about the middle of the 18th century in the production of high-yielding sugar cane and later the sugar beet, in the efficiency of the extraction of the sugar and the making of raw sugar, and finally in the process of refining the sugar. Thus the price fell constantly, the demand grew and consumption rose to exceedingly high levels. Legislators in many countries have often taxed sugar to provide revenue, just as they have often taxed tobacco and alcohol. And sugar also resembles alcohol and tobacco 
in that it is a material for which people rapidly develop a craving, and for which there is nevertheless no physiological need. I am saying, then, that human beings have a natural liking for sweet things, that primitive people could satisfy this desire by eating fruit or honey, and that in eating fruit, because they liked it, they obtained necessary nutrients, such as vitamin C. But now we can satisfy the desire for sweetness by consuming foods or drinks that provide little or no nutritional value except calories. It is possible today to get an orange drink that is more attractive in colour than true orange juice, is sweeter in taste, has a more aromatic flavour, is cheaper to buy, and can be guaranteed to contain no vitamin C whatever. Since people chiefly seek palatability in foods and drinks, the sale of these drinks increases all the time. One day it will no doubt be possible to manufacture from some non-digestible polymer a hamburger that looks more attractive than a real meat hamburger and smells and sizzles better on the barbecue at only half the price. It will be entirely pure in that it will contain neither protein nor vitamins nor minerals. And who will say that we shall not buy this super space-age new food just because it has no nutritional value. We shall buy it because we like it, and only because we like it. Most people still believe that foods that are palatable must have a high nutritional value. Many also believe what is equally untrue, that foods with little flavour have no nutritional value. I am certain that it is the disassociation of palatability and nutritional value that is the major cause of the malnutrition of affluence. For this reason, let me give you one or two more examples of how one can no longer expect the two qualities to be found together. First, you may remember beef tea, which even in this century was commonly given by doctors to their convalescent patients as a restorative and to this day many mothers believe that a tasty, clear soup is nourishing for their children. Yet here is high palatability with virtually no nutritional value. Second, the economics of chicken farming has produced a broiler chicken, which, because it is slaughtered young and because of the speed with which it is eviscerated, has less flavour than a free-range chicken. Yet its nutritional value is no different, even though its lower palatability is often referred to as indicating a lower nutritional value. Some time ago I read a short story, the title and author of which I have unfortunately forgotten. A brilliant chemist became tired of his mistress and decided to get rid of her by using his professional skill. He devoted himself to developing a new and exquisite flavour, which he then incorporated into chocolates, sending box after box to his mistress. Finding these quite irresistible, she consumed them in inordinate quantities until she died of overeating. The chemist knew that her craving would alone suffice to kill her. One more example of the strong power of palatability is the story of the snake that ordinarily will only eat toads. It will not, for example, eat pieces of meat such as beef, but you can make it do so by rubbing the beef onto the skin of the toad and so presumably making the beef taste of toad. One argument used by the health food people to demonstrate the poor nutritional value of modern processed foods is to claim that they have little flavour. Their own products, they say, must be nutritionally superior because they taste better. Much of what I have to say in this book is based on the proposition that satisfying our palates is no longer a guarantee that we are satisfying our nutritional needs.